I'm going to introduce Dr. Ryan Jones, um, mostly because it like saying Dr. Jones for you, like <laughs> Raiders nerds, you know, is, is really, I need a good German accent to say his name. Um, but contrary to what it says in the pamphlet, he is not in Dallas. He has been up at LSU Shreveport as the head of Pete's cardiology up there um, in Shreveport after having uh, been in Memphis for a long time. Um, but luckily, Shreveport has his wife's family, and he has four daughters, so they needed help. Um, and as someone who is in New Orleans, I'm extremely happy to have an adult congenital heart disease doctor who lives in the northern part of the state because there are a lot of patients and not a lot of doctors. Dr. Jones. All right. Thank you all for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I'm going to attempt to speak about the Fontan um, completion and its associated complications in 15 minutes or so. Uh, we'll see how fast I can get through it. I have no disclosures. I'm willing to accept anything if you all have anything available. Um, so first off, what is a Fontan? A Fontan is completing the cavopulmonary anastomosis. As Dr. Young just talked about with a bidirectional glen, you are sewing the superior vena cava onto the pulmonary arteries. This is completing that by sewing the inferior vena cava on in various forms. It was first described in 1971 by Dr. Fontan, thus the name Fontan, um, and it is now used to help with single ventricle patients to create the, the, the ability for them not to be cyanotic anymore. We do believe that cyanosis long-term may have some detrimental effects. However, as you'll learn from going through this, the Fontan does not have um, you know, perfect outcomes all the time. Uh, Fontan is a palliative procedure, and I say that multiple times throughout this, this talk because it is palliative. It is not fixing any problems. It is only allowing you to have a more normal type of circulation. In saying that, lots of individuals with Fontans can have near normal growth or normal growth and a very good quality of life, which is our ultimate goal. So this is... Um, some pictures of different types of Fontans because there's no one Fontan pathway. Label A there is the atriopulmonary Fontan. That's the original ones that are done and you will not see these performed anymore, uh, but you may still see patients with these. And I did not push that. Um, so what you will have is the atrium is directly attached to the uh, pulmonary arteries. Usually this is done by taking the atrial appendage, opening it up, and sewing it directly onto the pulmonary arteries. The one labeled B there is what's known of as the lateral tunnel fontan. And what they did with this, and these are still sometimes done, um, is they, from the inferior vena cava insertion into the right atrium, you use part of the right atrium and then you put a baffle to connect that up to the pulmonary arteries. Label C is the extracardiac Fontan. And um, I believe most surgeons that I've worked with prefer the extracardiac Fontan now because it's a little technically easier procedure. Um, and it is using a graft tube to connect the IVC directly to the pulmonary arteries. But as you can see with all of these, the goal is to have all the blue blood going here and all the red blood going here instead of having mixing. So it's estimated that there are 22,000 patients in Europe and 50,000 patients in the United States who have a Fontan. Um, you can see, you know, various ranges for, you know, diseases that would lead to a Fontan being needed. Um, we have gotten to the point where the majority of these patients do live into adulthood. Um, Mayo Clinic did a study of 40 years of Fontan patients. Um, the overall survival rates you can see there, 74% um, at 10 years, 61 at 20, 43 at 30%. However, in later surgical eras, we're getting much, much better. And on the most recent analysis they did in 2001, the 10-year survival rate was up to 95% as opposed to 74 overall. So what are some contraindications? What are some reasons that, as Dr. Young mentioned, we would not complete the Fontan? We would leave them as a bidirectional glen or a hemifontan. 
Um, elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. If your PVR is elevated, your blood is going passively into the lungs. If it's very elevated, the blood flow is not going to get into the lungs, therefore you're not going to get good um, blood flow into the, into the single ventricle. If you have poor single ventricular function, if the function of the one ventricle is not adequate to keep your systemic circulation up, you're not going to be able to tolerate the Fontan completion. And then if you have very severe AV valve regurgitation, that is not amenable to repair, because you can repair it at the time of the Fontan completion if possible, uh, but if you have severe AV valve regurgitation, once again, that's gonna lead to poor systemic uh, systolic function. So fenestrations, this is another thing that is commonly done with a Fontan. A fenestration is basically a hole right here in between your Fontan and your atrium. Um, this functions as a pop-off valve so that if you do have mildly increased pulmonary vascular resistance, you can maintain your systemic output while the body kind of adjusts to this new physiology. Um, it's highly debated as to if you need fenestration. Some surgeons will do it on every patient. Some surgeons will do it on no patients. Some surgeons will choose to do it on applicable patients. However, things we do know when you have a fenestration, you do need to have some type of anticoagulation because you do have blue blood then mixing into the systemic circulation and thromboembolic events can occur. In fact, it's been reported to be about 8% of Fontan deaths are related to these thromboembolic events. So what complications does this Fontan physiology give us? We have functional decline. We have electrical abnormalities. We have hepatic dysfunction. We have protein loss syndromes. We have renal dysfunction. Basically, if there's a system out there, this is going to somewhat affect it. So this is a, a study out of Mayo that looked at long-term mortality in Fontan patients. And you can see the leading cause is heart failure or Fontan failure leading to sudden death. But you also have sudden cardiac death. Arrhythmias is very high respiratory failure due to issues, renal disease, thromboembolic problems, or bleeding because you're anticoagulated, infections, protein-losing enteropathy. Malignancy is actually the lowest one on there, um, which is a good thing, I guess. So functional decline. So due to the physiologic changes that occur in the Fontan circulation, there is a chronic decreased systemic perfusion. The VO2 max, which is a measurement of the amount of oxygen that you utilize, is typically only up to about 25 milliliters per kilogram times minute versus in a normal biventricular heart, 35 is considered the normal. So you can see that the best you're gonna do is not even close to what would be considered normal in two functioning ventricles. Your systemic venous pressures are high in the presence of relatively pulmonary artery hyper hypotension, meaning you're not getting the higher systemic, uh, or the higher, not systemic, but pulmonary artery pressures from systole. You're getting a chronic, steadily elevated venous pressure. So you get decreased pulmonary perfusion. Realistically, the diastolic function of the single ventricle is what pulls the blood flow through the Fontan circulation. You can get hemodynamic obstruction of the Fontan pathways. This typically is in the LPA. Uh, it can be at the site of any anastomosis, however. And it's well documented that a non-left ventricular morphology will increase your risk of functional changes, and that's due to how the heart functions. The left ventricle, you know, we think about it, and you look at it in short axis, it looks like a donut, and it all squeezes concentrically. Well, that's great if it's the left ventricle. The right ventricle, however, twists. It doesn't squeeze, it twists. And if you have non-left ventricular morphology, you will have decreased function over time. So how do we test for that? We can do exercise testing. Um, you can, you know, we've shown that exercise training actually improves your quality of life, your functional class, your health perception in short-term follow-ups. There has actually been no studies looking at ACE inhibitors on long-term complications. Uh, this sildenafil has now been studied and, look, and shown to increase your ventricular function and your exercise capacity, as well as decreasing your uh, New York Heart Association status, uh, presumably due to lowered pulmonary vascular resistance. 
And bocentin, which is another pulmonary artery vasodilator, has not actually been shown to have long-term survival benefits. What about the electrical aspects of things? SVT, which is typically intraatrial reentry, atrial flutter, atypical flutter, um, consistently increases the longer time you are from surgery. Uh, it does matter what type of Fontan you have. It's much more common in atrial pulmonary Fontans or lateral tunnel Fontans. It's less likely in extracardiac Fontans, although it does still exist. It's anywhere from up to 10 to 60% of patients have some form of SVT <laughs> within a 20 year follow up time. Sinus node dysfunction can occur. If you remember from the pictures of the bidirectional glen, they're cutting the superior vena cava off right at the junction of the superior vena cava in the right atrium. That's where the sinus node lives. So you're cutting right through that area. So you can affect the sinus node uh, and cause scarring in that extra. Ventricular tachycardias are also seen, especially the, the more significant pulmonary, poor ventricular function associated with that. So looking at studies of patients who survived greater than 30 days after the Fontan, 35% atrial flutter, 19% AFib, 13% atrial tachycardias, 4% are typical SVTs, 5% VTAC, and 13% sinus node dysfunction. Predictors include uh, atrial pulmonary Fontans, the later the Fontan completion was performed, or other atrial arrhythmias in the immediate postoperative period. Of note, 5% sudden cardiac death here. How do we treat them? We treat them the same way we treat other um, uh, arrhythmias. You know, you use the standard medications depending on the type of rhythm that's there. We can do catheter ablations for um, these patients with arrhythmias. However, getting there can be the issue. How do you get into the left atrium to ablate a focus in the left atrium? You have to poke a hole across the Fontan that leads to increased complexity and increased risk. Pacemaker implantation, if you have sinus node dysfunction, is something that's really difficult to obtain also because you have to put it epicardially. You can't get there with the leads unless you're gonna put something in a low flow um, pathway that can increase your risk of thrombosis. Your pacemaker thresholds are increased due to scarring of the myocardium from previous surgeries. Now let's talk about hepatic dysfunction now. This is something that's becoming a huge thing in patients with Fontans. The chronic elevated central venous pressures lead to congestion, you get parenchymal hyperperfusion and fibrosis of the liver. We don't know how best to monitor it, we don't know all of the details behind it, but almost everybody who has a Fontan has at least mild involvement. It can be thrombocytopenia, it can be elevations in liver enzymes. However, it can go as far as cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma formation. Ascites frequently occurs with this, and synthetic function is very late occurring in the hepatic disease. So, you know, you actually do well from that standpoint, but the liver itself will get a lot of scarring. This is just some stains looking at a biopsy of a liver in a Fontan patient. You can see in, the, in slide A, the blue is all fibrosis and B, the red is all fibrosis that's being, scar being shown there. Like I said, there's no consensus on the optimal evaluation of the liver. We use ultrasounds, we look at LFTs, we do something called elastography, which looks at how compliant the livers are. CTs, MRIs, biopsies, all are used to look at how the hepatic changes are occurring in the, due to the Fontan circulation. The ACC has a position statement that suggests imaging every, at least every three to five years in children and one to three years in adult Fontan patients. Like I said, each center kind of has their own process of how they do that these days, uh, depending on what's available and who can actually evaluate that. But the biggest problem is what do we do once those changes are found? As you heard Dr. Young mention before, sometimes you're talking about having to go to a liver and heart transplant, which is not the uh, technically easiest thing to deal with. Protein loss syndromes. There are two main protein loss syndromes that occur secondary to the Fontan circulation. Protein losing enteropathy, also known as PLE, and plastic bronchitis. These causes are multifactorial, but in the end result is a break in the integrity of the mucosal lining, 
Therefore, your proteins tend to spill into luminal cavities, either in your GI tract or into your lungs. Um, lowering central venous pressure, increasing cardiac output, and ultimately heart transplant are how you have to treat these issues. So PLE uh, is an abundant loss of proteins. They lead to loose fatty stools. So, you know, that's one thing you always want to check with your patients is, you know, are their stools normal? Are they not having normal stools? You get hypoproteinemia, you get ascites, you get lymphatic insufficiency. They are at increased risk of infection because they're losing all of their immunoglobulin proteins into uh, their GI tract. They have increased loss of clotting factors, so they're at increased risk of bleeding due to that. Um, you can, you know, the treatment basically, um, the way I look at it is called the kitchen sink treatment. You throw everything out there at it, you can, uh, including budesonide, which is a steroid, pulmonary vasodilators, uh, fenestrating the fontan, and ultimately transplantation. Plastic bronchitis, the protein loss can sometimes go directly into the bronchi and it leads to cast formation. And you can see this picture here uh, is one that was removed and you can see it's a nice cast formation of the entire bronchial tree. Um, you know, this will lead to life-threatening airway obstructions. You can try tissue plasminogen activator to break up these casts so that they can cough them out. Uh, you can have bronchoscopy to remove them, but ultimately you have to change them with a transplant if they survive long enough. Renal dysfunction. Mild to moderate renal insufficiency is seen in over a third of patients with Fontan physiology at 14 years post-Fontan. Those with higher central venous pressures have a higher in incidence of that. Microalbuminuria is seen in 37% of these patients. Combined, over 57% of Fontan patients have some form of renal dysfunction associated uh, due to the palliation. Postoperative renal insufficiency is associated with an increased risk of late mortality. You can see your, your, your uh, ratio there is a 2.5 increased risk of, of late mortality due to renal dysfunction. So conclusion, the alteration of the cardiopulmonary physiology and the Fontan palliation can have effects on numerous body systems. We do have limitations into how to treat these issues when they arrive, but they need close monitoring, not only by a cardiologist who understands the physiology, but by primary care physicians and other subspecialists who have an understanding of this physiology.